Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. I greet you in the name of the risen and ascended Christ, who has promised to return and to bring justice to our broken world. Uh, we are thrilled that you're here. As you were coming in, there were elements for communion. If you didn't get a chance to grab those, we encourage you to sometime during our service uh, to make sure you get those so you'll be prepared for our time of communion later on. And uh, let's all join together. I invite you to stand, and we're going to have a call to worship that will be played via video today. So let's give our attention to the screens and join together in this call to worship. Good morning. It's wonderful to worship with you all today. Please join us in our call to worship. This will be a responsive reading, so please join in as instructed on the screen. God is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? God is our shelter and refuge on the days of trouble and our hope and joy on the days of celebration. Day after day, we seek God's face and the assurance of God's holy love. O oh God, do not turn from us or hide your face from us. Be our guide and our light instead. One thing we may ask of God, that we may live in God's dwelling place all the days of our life and never cease to behold the beauty of God's home. Beloved of God, enter this worship in thanksgiving, for God is among and within us. Thanks be to God.
singing as we enter into a time of prayer I invite you as we do each week to just reflect upon previous days maybe consider the days coming and what you are looking forward to maybe what you're anxious for and in this moment Let's just allow the Lord to draw to mind those things for which we are grateful, those things that we're thankful for, but also the moments in which we fall short or we were disappointed, harmed, grieved, angered. May we offer these to the Lord in this moment of silence.
Amen. Church, I invite you to join me in this corporate prayer this morning. Words will be on the screen for you. Please join me as we pray. Almighty and merciful God, we confess that we have erred and strayed from your ways. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Restore those who confess their faults according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh merciful God, that we may live a life, just and humble life, to the glory of your name. Amen. In church, the psalm declares that those who speak the truth from their heart will abide in God's sanctuary. God hears the difficult truths that, it, that we have named aloud and the silent ones that we've held in our hearts. Now let the wonderful gift of God's forgiveness flow through you. May the abundance of God's mercy and grace set you free to serve God with love. Please join me in saying, thanks be to God. Blessed are the ones in mourning, brave enough to show the Lord their scars. Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing touch of God. I'm sorry, I'm misleading you all. <laughs> I'd like to give this song its justice, and I started on the wrong verse, so we're going to start over. Let's just do that. And blessed are the ones who do not bury all the broken pieces of their heart. Blessed are the tears of all the weary pouring like a sky of falling stars. And blessed are the wounded ones in mourning brave enough Show the Lord the scars. Blessed are the hurts that are not hidden, open to the healing touch of God. The kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. Blessed are the ones who walk in the in the face of grace.
kingdom is yours. The kingdom is yours. Hold on a little more. This is not the end. Hope is in the Lord. Keep your eyes on Him. The kingdom. Blessed are the ones who suffer violence And still have strength to love their enemies Blessed is the faith of those who persevere Though they fall and never know defeat The kingdom singing. Children, you'll be with us today, so why don't we turn to one another and greet each other in the name of the Lord.
Hey, good morning. Let's find our way back to our seats. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of you. Thanks so much for being with us today. I want to share a couple of announcements of things that are going on in the life of the church. If you didn't get one of these as you came in, hopefully you'll take a moment to grab a bulletin. It's got some helpful information in it uh, with our life groups, got sermon notes. It's just stuffed filled with goodies. Just making sure you're listening, okay? Just make sure you catch the sarcasm there. So, uh, hey, today's Intergenerational Sunday, which means we have all ages in the sanctuary with us today. Uh, these days are a really great opportunity for us to affirm that every member, uh, no matter their age, is a valued member of our community. Uh, parents, this is a great opportunity to demonstrate in front of your children what worship looks like. Um, and we encourage you to engage your kids in worship. And so if there's ever a time where they have questions about why do we do this or what is this all about, uh, take a moment to answer those questions as best you can. If you don't know the answer to those questions, we would be happy to uh, help speak into that a little bit. So come to us afterwards and say, hey, why do we do this in that order and that kind of thing? Um, believe it or not, we do what we do on purpose. Um, and so we do have a reason for why we kind of structure the worship service the way that we do. So we encourage you uh, to do that. And uh, it's great to have our kiddos uh, in, in the sanctuary with us today. Also, today is our back-to-school kickoff uh, after church, so you're invited to join us at Eudora Park, which is just a few minutes away from here for a game of kickball. We encourage you to uh, stop by somewhere, or maybe you brought your lunch, but bring your own lunch to the park. Uh, we'll gather near the playground area over at Eudora Park, so somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, so look for us there, and uh, we hope that you'll um, make a point to join us. It should be a great time uh, to be together. Uh, we also hope that you'll sign up for one of our life groups. Uh, today, as you leave, in the foyer are some uh, music stands and clipboards with all of our life groups uh, on there. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up, make sure to stop by one of theirs uh, and just mark your name down. We'll also have those sign-ups available at the kickoff. Uh, if you have signed up already and heard from your group leader, you don't need to sign up again today. Uh, but we just encourage everyone to sign up. So if you were part of a group uh, before our fall kind of relaunch and you want to remain part of that group, either communicate directly with your uh, life group host or sign up for that same group again. Uh, so we hope that you'll do that. Uh, but we're just trying to kind of reboot all of our life groups and um, make sure that everybody that wants to be a part of a life group can find a home uh, in a group uh, this fall. So uh, those are the things that are going on in the life of the church. So let's say a word of prayer, and we'll uh, get started with this morning's message, uh, which is the first message in a brand new series called Broken Signposts. So let's pray. Gracious God, we recognize your presence with us today. And we ask uh, humbly that um, as we have taken time out of our busy schedules, uh, out of other responsibilities to gather together, uh, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would uh, meet us in this place, that you would encourage us, uh, that you would give us new insights, um, that we would um, be touched by your Holy Spirit, whether that be a word of encouragement, whether that be a word of, of conviction and challenge of something in our lives that needs to change, uh, be realigned, or maybe, God, it's the opportunity to be with one another and to uh, reconnect to, be, uh, to build relationships. So God, we pray that you would be with us in these moments uh, together as we open up your word and uh, seek to gain greater understanding and be formed into your likeness. We also pray, God, for your blessing and your anointing on our time uh, this afternoon uh, with a silly activity, uh, but we're, we're praying that that would be sacred space as we have an opportunity to be together and become reconnected. So Lord, thank you uh, for your goodness to us and just pray that you would be with us in these moments, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, my family, we recently moved into a new house, uh, which means there's lots and lots of tasks to be done. Uh, the to-do list just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, there's organizing to do, hanging pictures, uh, putting items into their place, and uh, for us, after transitioning into a new home, there was lots and lots of putting together of ready-to-assemble furniture, <laughs> which is code for Ikea, right? <laughs> like, when you don't really want to admit that you've been to Ikea, you're like, it's ready-to-assemble furniture, you know? Uh, so in the first few uh, days after moving, I, I spent literally hours upon hours down on the floor 
uh, surrounded by nuts, bolts, screws, and cutouts of particle board that were supposed to come together to form something comprehensible, right? Uh, the only saving grace was that in my hand I had a picture of what this thing was supposed to look like when it was all put together, and thankfully in that I also had step-by-step -step instructions of how to get it done. Now, for any of you that have ever participated in this sacred act of furniture assembly, you know and recognize that it can be stressful, right? Uh, you start with high hopes of the quality of your build and with high expectations of how quickly it will go. And so you think to yourself, surely by lunch I will have put together most of the pieces in this room. And then at 2 p.m., you're eating cold pizza for lunch, and you're thinking, this did not go as I thought, like, like I thought it would, or how it was supposed to. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it was because right when I was nearly done assembling this piece of furniture, I realized that everything was reversed, and now I need to start over. So this thing that you were supposed to assemble once, you assemble most of the way, you disassemble and then reassemble, can I get an Amen. All right, I just want to make sure I'm not all alone here, okay? And so you realize, you know, this, even though I had a picture of how this was supposed to go, even though I had step-by-step -step instructions, when all the pieces are out, it's really difficult to kind of make sense of it all, even though you have a hint or a clue of what it's supposed to be. Isn't it true that our experience of life is sometimes just exactly like that? We have clues, we have hints, we have signs, or a sense of what the world, um, the sense that, of, that the world ought to make, or how things should work or should be put together. Uh, and these things, these hints, these clues kind of point us in the direction, uh, but ultimately are, are difficult. Ultimately, they, they're a little bit slippery, it's hard to grasp, and Sometimes these things don't work out quite like they should. Uh, in this way, these things are broken signposts. And so during our series called Broken Signposts, we're going to explore seven clues or hints or signs in the world that kind of point us to meaning, they point us to something larger than themselves, and yet ultimately are difficult to get a grasp on. Um, there's, there are things that every culture throughout history has valued in some way as a way of making sense of the world. Here's what I'm talking about. The seven themes we're going to look at are justice, love, spirituality, beauty, freedom, truth, and power. Those seven themes are our agenda for the next seven Sundays. And what we're going to do is we're going to explore these broken signposts. Uh, but we're going to explore them in light of the Christian message in order that we might begin to get a sense uh, of these things, better understand what these things are, but then also the, how they might point us to God's activity in the world. And so this morning, we want to give our attention to the broken signpost of justice. Now, when I say the word justice... Um, Actually, before I get started, I would want to reference you uh, to a whole sermon series that we did just on justice a couple years ago. Uh, I think it was like 2019 or so. Uh, so if that's of interest to you or if, to, if today's discussion is of interest to you, I encourage you to kind of go back and listen to those from a couple of years ago. Uh, but when I say the word justice, I wonder what comes to mind. Uh, for most of us, justice is a sense where uh, punishment is equal to the crime, right? Right? Justice is punishment that's equal to the crime. Uh, someone being held accountable for wrongs that have been done. And our desire, our innate desire for justice runs really deep. Uh, when we or someone we love is wronged, we want those things to be made right. We want the person who did the wrong to be held accountable for their actions. Uh, I think this is, at least in part, part of the appeal of uh, the superhero movie, right? Right? Uh, in the superhero movie, there's usually a very clear villain who seeks to carry out a devious plan, but whose plan is thwarted, and in the end, the enemy is destroyed. All things are made right thanks to the superhero, right? They are seen as the carriers of justice. And, and I think that we love these movies because it's very satisfying, actually, to see evildoers kind of put in their place. 
Uh, this is maybe why um, kind of thriller novels, crime-based novels and TV shows are so popular as well. You can't hardly turn on the TV without some sort of crime-based show uh, where there's a crime committed and then all the detective work is done and in the end justice is served, the evildoer is held accountable for their actions. Let me offer a little side note here. While the plot of most superhero movies are kind of like that, I do appreciate the attempts that Marvel has made to uh, not oversimplify this narrative, which is to say, uh, that's right, okay, good. Wow, I got an amen on a side note, guys. This is, I'm preaching really well. This is amazing. Uh, so, which is to say, I really appreciate like a somewhat complicated superhero movie. I like when they complicate that narrative a little bit. Okay, that's my side note. Any more amen? Okay, okay. Um, so, so our desire, our desire for justice and for wrongs to be made right is very, very clear. Uh, what isn't so clear is that our attempts to carry out justice on a societal level uh, aren't always so successful, right? Uh, isn't it true that we create justice systems that sometimes convict innocent people or sometimes unfairly target certain populations? Uh, but it doesn't just stop there. I mean, it's like when we go to execute justice or carry out justice uh, and we go to fix a wrong, but... What about the wrong before that? Or, or, or like how far back do you have to go in fixing the wrongs to actually call it justice? Just think about, for example, the complexity of national relationships in the Middle East as an example of how the concept of justice can get really uh, tricky very, very quickly. And so the truth is, is that while we long for justice, what justice looks like isn't always perfectly clear and the process of carrying out justice is often very complicated. And so in this sense, justice is a broken signpost. It points us to something greater than itself. We know that justice is really central to making sense of our lives together, our shared life of the world in which we find ourselves, and yet it's kind of slippery, it's complicated, it's nuanced, it isn't always clear. It's a broken signpost, which is why I think Many people find great confidence that God is a God of justice. We find comfort in knowing that God will not allow injustice to continue, that that which is wrong will be put right. Thanks be to God. Right? But even that kind of confidence, even that, that level of declaration, God is a God of justice, comes with a whole set of questions, comes with a whole set of nuance and complications. I mean, what does this God-brought justice look like, and how is God's justice accomplished? Many have assumed that God is a kind of an ultimate superhero, that God will swoop in, thwart the evil plan, kill all the bad people, and will be saved in the end. Amen. And so the kind of superhero motif is one that we transplant onto God. God is the ultimate superhero. When we consider justice, there are three questions that rise to the surface that must be considered. And the three questions are this. Who is in charge? What is the truth of the matter? And who has the power to change it? Three really important questions, right? An injustice is there, we see it, we recognize it as such. Who's in charge? What is the truth of the matter? And who has the power to change it? These are really important questions. And to help address them or speak into those and to make sense of the broken signpost of justice, I want to look at none other than the cross of Jesus Christ. And so John chapter 18 Beginning with verse 33, I want to read a lengthy passage of Scripture that's going to lead us right up to uh, the cross. So this is kind of just preceding the cross. It's John chapter 18. I want to begin reading with verse 33. I'll read through verse 40 of that chapter, and then I'll skip to uh, verse 13 in chapter 19. So uh, this may be a little bit hard to follow along, uh, but you can hear it um, nonetheless. So John chapter 18, beginning with verse 33, says this. Uh, then Pilate entered the headquarters again. He summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? 
Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. So what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. For if my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So Pilate asked him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king, and for this reason I was born, for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth, that everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again, and he told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? But they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a bandit. Now, skip down to chapter 19, beginning with verse 13. It says this, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside, sat him on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about to be noon, and he said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then they handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This story is actually quite fascinating, particularly when you have in mind the three questions that we've just posed as it relates to justice, all right? Who's in charge? What is the truth of the matter? And who has the power to change it? Uh, In a very real sense, as we read the story of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion, it appears that Pilate holds all the cards. Pilate has all the political power. Pilate seems to be the guy in charge, the one who can Uh, kind of dole out consequences, the one who can declare what is right, the one who can set prisoners free or send people to crucifixion. In a very real sense, the answer to these three questions seems to be Pilate. And in, in a surprising twist of the story, and if we were reading it for the first time, I think it would be surprising, Jesus is convicted and then sent to the cross. The conviction of Jesus is supposed to be surprising, because he is an innocent man. The scriptures make that clear. Even Pilate, the one holding all the power, recognizes and bears witness to the fact that this man has done nothing wrong. And so Jesus is an innocent man, and so yet he is convicted and sent to his death. And as readers, if we were reading this for the very first time, if we were hearing this story with fresh ears, we, would, we are supposed to be led to cry, this is an injustice. How could this happen? There are a lot of lenses through which we can view the cross, but one such lens is to see that this Jesus who is put on trial and convicted and killed as an innocent man is in fact a miscarriage of justice. In the cross, we see all the complexities of justice in the world in which we live, in the world as we know it. Remember, at the beginning of the message, we were kind of exploring the idea of how justice is actually quite complicated. And we see here the complexity of justice as we try to carry it out as best as we understand it and what we know of it, that it can be a very slippery thing. Because the system that is set up to execute justice ended up executing an innocent man. The system failed. And the power brokers get away with their plan to rid the world of the perceived threat of the Jesus movement, at least for a moment, right? Don't worry, we're getting to resurrection. Some of you are getting worried. (laughs) This is, in fact, the world we inhabit. Complicated, nuanced, broken signposts. Things that we know are supposed to matter, to point beyond themselves, to be carried out, to point us to meaning in the world are sometimes miscarried. This is the broken world that Jesus was born into, and this is the broken world that Jesus came to save. 
In fact, let's turn back the clock to Christmas and just make one Christmas observation. Incarnation, what it means to be incarnate is to enter the world as it is. Jesus was not born into an idealized version of the world, into like a perfect version of the world or or, or something else. Jesus entered into the world as it is, and as we see later on as a grown man, sent to his death and yet innocent. It's the very world that Jesus entered into and came to save. The very world into which Jesus came to announce the good news. And part of that good news was the arrival of a new kind of justice. You see, justice, as best we understand it, right? Punishment equal to the crime, and yet sometimes that's hard to carry, hard to carry out, hard to, to, to put into effect in, in a perfect way. And so what Jesus, what we see in the life of Jesus is that in, after the announcement of a new kind of justice coming actually becomes subject to an injustice. And so the very world in which Jesus came to announce the good news, the arrival of a new kind of justice, which is restorative justice. Actually, John, the gospel writer, bears witness to this in John chapter 3 when he says, light has entered into the world. Of course, we know as resurrection people, as good news people, that the cross is not the end of the story. Because on Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead, and that changes everything. For in the death of Jesus, what we find is that the real source of wickedness is laid bare. It's exposed. The real source of wickedness is the system that puts an innocent man to death, of which a betraying Judas, plotting religious leaders, and a Roman governor are all complicit. Are you with me? And through the resurrection, though, that system is robbed of its power. It did its worst. It put a man to death, and it still did not win. And so how I want to see, how I want to frame justice this morning is that God overcomes the evil that was working through political power and violence by becoming subject to the political powers and violence exposing them for what they are, and then launching new creation. Okay, that was really good, but I'm not sure you're totally with me, so let me say it again, right? Uh, seriously, like this, this is right at the heart of the thing, okay? This is right at the heart of the, of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and what it means. God overcomes evil, the, the evil that was working through political power and violence, by becoming subject to those political powers and violence, exposing them for what they are, and then launching new creation, new justice, and new power into the world through resurrection. Amen? I mean, this is right at the heart of the gospel. And so our inclination for justice has always been spot on. Our inclination, our desire, our deep longing for something to be made right, for those to be held accountable, like this kind of sense of justice has always been right, but our understanding of justice, our concept of justice has been a little bit off. We've assumed all along that justice is punishment equal to the crime, but the cross and the resurrection of Jesus shows us, and I'm, 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 we're taking a dive in the deep end, but stick with me, the cross and resurrection of Jesus shows us that God's justice is not the perfection of a system where the punishment is equal to the crime. God's justice is not the perfection of that system. God's justice is one where creation is restored. And so it's a restorative justice, not a punitive justice. When God's justice comes to bear, things are restored to their proper place, not the proper punishment doled out. This is the justice of God, the justice that is launched at the cross when God in Christ becomes a victim of injustice. There is about 10 years of theology to kind of chew on in this sermon, okay? So if if you leave here with more questions than answers, that's okay. Give yourself grace, okay? I've done the best I can to communicate this in a clear way. 
And so, God's justice is not the perfection of the system that we've known it, as we've known it. Equal punishment, or punishment equal to the crime. God's justice is restorative, not punitive. God seeks to make things new, to restore them, not just push to the side. Okay. Now, some of you are thinking, right? But what about? Okay? And my, I want to speak into the but what about. We have an opportunity and the free will to choose to participate in God's restorative justice in the world or to refuse it. And to refuse God's restorative justice in the world comes with inherent consequences. Comes with consequences built in. Okay? So we have an opportunity, opportunity to either see this, accept, and then participate with the good news of the gospel and God's restorative justice, or we have an opportunity to say, oh, that's not how it is, and just kind of continue down uh, the wide road. Because a commitment to restorative justice is, in fact, the narrow road. And so what we have an opportunity to do as we look at the world is we are invited then to bear witness to God's restorative justice even while working in a system of punitive justice, right? Justice in our world as we know it, as we best, as best understand it, as we try to carry it out is a punitive justice. How do we carry out punishment that is equal to the crime as best as we can? We're caught in that system, right? But we as the people of God are called as best we can with creativity, with discernment, with God's wisdom leading us to say, how do we bear witness to restorative justice? This work is often complicated and nuanced. But let me give us just a couple of pictures of what it might look like. Restorative justice helps us pray for perpetrators of injustice as well as victims. A commitment to restorative justice leads us to pray for both perpetrators and victims. Because we recognize that the perpetrator of injustice is harming their own self as well as the victims. Right? And so as the people of God committed to this restoration, we want to say, how do we pray for the perpetrators as well. We've tried to always do this when there's kind of mass acts of violence uh, in our world. We've tried to always pray for both the victims and the perpetrators because we want to be committed to restorative justice. Restorative justice, this one's going to come right into your living room, okay? You ready? <laughs> restorative justice helps us pray for peace among all the nations, not just victory for our nation. Restorative justice helps lead us to a posture where we will be willing to pray for peace among all the nations, not just victory for our nation. It helps us seek to understand what motivates the protest instead of condemning the protesters. Restorative justice motivates us to be creative and to ask, what does new creation and restoration look like in this situation, rather than just seeking out punishment that is equal to the crime? Now, does this mean that wrongdoing is free of consequence? No, I am not saying that. Do not mishear me. Wrongdoing comes with consequences, and there are reason for laws of the land, and there are reason for the laws of God. But ultimately, as the people of God, we want to be committed to a restoration rather than just say, oh, the punishment has been doled out. We're all good. We're clear. This person got what, quote, what they deserved, right? That's not the end of the story. It comes with consequences. Those consequences are sometimes necessary. Those boundaries are necessary. And yet, we want to lean into what does it look like for restoration, new creation to enter into this. Okay, so my next note is nuance. Let me be clear that a commitment to God's restorative justice does not mean that our actions do not have consequences. I got there without the notes. <laughs> okay? So uh, I, I just want to, I want to help us see that as the people of God, our, our, our concept, I'm praying that our concept of justice 
would be expanded so that we move beyond just punishment equal to the crime and that we begin to lean into God's heart for restoration and new creation. And, and I do not have all the answers, and I recognize that this comes with a whole set of nuance and complexity. But I try to have a commitment that the sermon shouldn't be the final word, but the first word. In other words, my hope and my goal with this sermon and all of them is that there would be something to talk about and to kind of mull over and to get together in your groups and your life groups and friendships and organic getting like meetings and, and just say like, hey, what about this? And did you hear that? And, and, th- and, and begin to wrestle with it. Because if we're not wrestling, then, then we, we just kind of come to the th- believe that we have all the answers, right? We just kind of think everything's kind of neat, tied up in a bow, and this whole thing is just real clear when, in fact, there's tons of nuance. Um, and so I want it to be not the last word, but maybe the first word. Uh, let me leave us uh, with a quote uh, from... <laughs> I just laugh now. It's just become such a joke, but a quote from N.T. Wright. Um, And and actually, let me just, just full disclosure, the the series Broken Signposts uh, is is largely based on a book by N.T. Wright of the same title. Uh, So we're going to get a, like, we always have a healthy diet of N.T. Wright, uh, but we're about to gorge. Um, We're about to gorge on on N.T. Wright over here for the next few weeks. Um, And then I promise to to take a break. Um, But N.T. Wright says this, The risen Jesus has won the victory over injustice. Just let that sink in. The risen Jesus has won the victory over injustice. New creation has been launched right in our midst. Amen? And now sends his followers to work on the multiple projects of new creation Because justice itself, restorative, healing, life-giving justice, is central to the task. Restorative justice is central to the task of new creation. Amen. Amen. Well, I've given us, I think, a lot to think about, and uh, hopefully we'll have a lot to think about over the course of this series as well. So let's say a word of prayer and ask God to help us. God of wisdom and all-knowing, for whom concepts like justice, love, spirituality, freedom, truth, power, are not complicated, but are clear. And so God, in your perfect wisdom, would you help us to work these things out? We live in a world in which these things that provide meaning and, and framework for our lives are in fact broken they have not yet found their perfect expression in the world, although we see their perfect expression in you. And so God, our prayer is that as we lean into these truths, that you would help us as best we can to to wrestle and to come to greater knowledge. But more than that, that that knowledge would be churned into formation, that we might be formed into your likeness. That if there's any adjustments or new insights, uh, or adjustments in our thinking, or new insights that we come across, Lord, that we would then wrestle with those. So that then maybe our posture toward the world or our actions in the world might be different or changed as a result. And so God, give us wisdom, give us discernment, and may we be formed as your people, we pray. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me lead us to the Lord's table today. Um, when we have children with us for communion, we always like to just share that um, we believe that God's grace is extended to us in a very real way through the communion table, that, that God meets us as we gather around the table. And we believe that there's really no age limit to that. And so we're going to leave it up to you as parents. If you want your children to participate in communion, they are more than welcome to do so. Uh, If you choose to have your children abstain, we support you 100% in that decision. And so we leave it up to you as parents as we gather around the Lord's table. 
And so let's do just that. If you have uh, elements of communion, those worshiping online, if you haven't already, now's a great time to find elements uh, that represent the body and blood of Christ. And so let's gather around the Lord's table today. I invite you to come, whoever you are, wherever you are from, for you are welcome here. Come those who have much, those who have little, those who are strong, those who are weak, those who know much about God and those who are just beginning to learn. Those who have come to church all their lives and those of you who are here for the very first time, for this is the Lord's table. And the same Jesus Christ who took on the sin of the world in his death welcomes all people to come and taste and see that God is good. Communion is a reminder for us of what God has done through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. That the God who created us is the God who forgives us and cares for us and calls us to wholeness and everlasting life in Jesus Christ. And so now through the power of the Holy Spirit, we share in this bread and this cup and we celebrate the love that binds us one to another as a family of God. And so it is that all who trust Jesus, whether a little or a lot, and those who want to trust him more, are welcome to come and be part of the feast that he has prepared. So as we gather around the Lord's table today, I invite you to join me in proclaiming the mystery of our faith. Would we say this out loud together? Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks, then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Each time you eat it, do so in remembrance of me and be thankful. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant that has been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And now, having celebrated the generosity of God, we then commit ourselves to living lives of generosity through this generosity prayer. You can follow along with me. Uh, actually, let's say it out loud together. It looks like it's ready here on the screen, so let's say it, out to get, say it out loud together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay but will shine in the age to come. Amen. Amen. As Bob is coming to lead us in the prayers of the people, I just want to remind you that if you've come today uh, with a gift to support our ministry, you can give that in the um, boxes that are in the foyer, and you can always give online. And if you find yourself in a season of need, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. We'd love to help meet that need in whatever way we can. So let's enter into a time of prayer as Bob leads us. Let's answer, answer prayer. Find a position that you are comfortable in and begin to push things out of your mind that would interfere. Let's take a deep breath and breathe out all of our anxiety and our worry and let's focus on the Lord. Lord, we rejoice in you and we praise your name. By your word, the heavens were made, and all the universe by the breath of your mouth. You gather the waters of the sea as in a bottle. All your creation stands in awe of you, for you spoke, and it came to be. Your word, Lord, is upright, and all your work is done in faithfulness. You love righteousness and justice, the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Lord, you look down from heaven and you see all mankind. From where you sit enthroned, you watch all the inhabitants of the earth. You fashion the hearts of all of us and observe all our deeds. 
truly you know about our lives. We who hope in your steadfast love, you deliver our souls from death, and you keep us alive in times of trouble. Our souls wait for you, Lord. You are our help and shield. Our hearts are glad because we trust in your holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Lord, because you are the giver of all good things, we take this time to thank you for all you have given us. Lord, I thank you for my family. I thank believers who become my family. I thank you for the blessings of life. Lord, in reflecting upon the sermon this morning, I thank you that you have put in our souls that help us recognize when something is wrong. I thank you, Father, for your patience with us, for your compassion to us. You know the injustice that we have felt and experienced. And you also know that we don't always respond perfectly according to your ways. Thank you, Father, that you are restoring us in the world. You are providing us healing justice. You are helping us to bring justice into the world through our lives. Reflect for a moment and silently consider all the other good things you've received from the Lord and give thanks. Lord, most of, most of all, we are grateful for your gift of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, by which he disarmed the evils and injustices of the world, triumphing over them. Now in the confidence that if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us, we bring to you our request. Father, we lift up Afghanistan to you this morning. We pray for the families of all who have experienced these. Father, we lift up the people of New Orleans as they are getting ready for another hurricane. We ask for your salvation, for your rescue. Father, we ask for your help for 
the people of California with their fires and the smoke that now blank the entire nation, affecting those who have breathing problems. It's for help. Father, we pray for your justice. We pray for your restoration. Father, give us wisdom as we find ways in our own life to bring divine justice into the world. Restore in us a, a heart for understanding, compassion, and fairness for all who have been oppressed. Father, we pray for the perpetrators. As Jesus told us, to bless our persecutors. Let us pray for our world and our nation, for God's peace and justice to prevail. Let's pray for our leaders who need a lot of help at this moment. Offer now your silent prayers to God on behalf of those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit. for those problems that are only known to you in the secret places of your heart, but they're also known to God. Lift them up and receive from him. Pray for our family members who are away from the Lord. Pray that we can be instruments of your peace to bring them home. And now, Lord, as members of your kingdom, we remember and pray together the prayer you taught your first disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It has been a pleasure to worship with you this morning, together in song, in word, in gathering at the table, and in prayer. And now I invite you to hold out your hands as we receive this commission inspired by our word today. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, 
So God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go now to be light for the world. And may the grace and peace of God the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Please join me in singing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.